Let's go ahead and worship God in your own words. Say, Lord, thank you. Be lifted, be glorified. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me an opportunity to come in your presence this afternoon. I give you praise because there's no other one like you. Indeed, be glorified in my thoughts, be glorified in my ways, because, Lord, there's no one else that deserves glory except you, O Lord. Just enjoy the presence of your Father this afternoon. And he has promised us when we gather in his name, he's with us. Might you be reminded of one person who does not know God and you'd wish them to come to this knowledge, the saving grace of our Lord. Just commit them to the hands of God this afternoon and say, Lord, the same way I enjoy your presence, I ask that the lost will know you. That even in this service as we, we have joined your presence, we remember people who have not yet accepted you as Lord and Savior. Lord, have mercy on them. Have mercy on them. There are many that are disturbed, many that are being tossed and swayed around. They have no idea the joy that is in knowing you. This afternoon, Lord, may there be an outpouring of your grace. In this mission week, Lord, we ask that many people will come to know you and they will find rest in you. Continue to minister to us this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, give him praise. Amen. Be seated. Praise the Lord. Let's clap for the band for leading us well in this hour. I want us to quickly turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. This week is Mission Sunday, Mission Week, and today is Mission Sunday. And uh, whereas we are expected to share the gospel every day and witness to Christ every day of our lives through every activity, this particular week we want to call your attention to to just share the gospel, but also give an opportunity to many other people that might not know the Lord, to just give their hearts and lives to the Lord. And so I'll be sharing from Isaiah chapter 1. Let me just read that text. I'll read up to verse 20. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, Children give to corruption, given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole, heads, your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds and bruises and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire, your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls 
and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord. Come now, let us reason together. This Mission Sunday, I would want to share with us about that invitation that God makes, come now, let us reason together. And I want to begin by asking us questions. Do you sometimes wonder how God sees you. Have you ever sat down to ask, how does God see me? Ask, what does God want from me? Most of us care a lot about what people think about us. And I think we are obsessed with how we want people to think about us, to see us. We are, we get engrossed in what we want people to think of us. And so, many times we are not objective with ourselves. And because we want people to think about us a certain way, we dress up in a certain way, we wear certain perfumes or body odor. We, we want to present an image that is biased, that is inclined to what we want people to think of us. But have you ever wondered, what does God really think about me? How does God see me? <clears throat> Isaiah, in this text, proclaims how God saw his people and what God wanted for them. Please take note, how God sees them versus what God wanted them to be, wanted them to do. And I can tell you, from what you have read, as I, what you have heard as I read, it is not what the people wanted to hear. A lot of what I have read is not what Israel wanted to hear. But that is how God saw them, and that is what God wanted them to do. And I'm not going to do anything less than what God wants us to hear this afternoon. Praise the name of the Lord. And so let me invite you to pay attention to how God, not just how he sees us, but how he wants to help us for the good of us, what his plan is for us. And to do this for Israel, God gave a vision. God gave a vision to Isaiah. And the word vision, when somebody says, I had a vision, it sounds nice. Amen? Oh, yeah. A lot of the time when somebody says, I had a vision about you, you want to hear. You cancel programs to so just go and listen. What is the Lord saying? But this particular vision is not what Israel wanted to hear. In as much as it sounds nice, it is quite disturbing. And I will tell you this afternoon that sometimes what God wants to say to us is disturbing. Amen. And for Israel in this text, it was quite disturbing. However, God wanted to address the darkness that he was seeing 
for his people in the nation of Israel. And I am sure God wants to address the darkness that sees in us. Even as we go through this week of mission, there are particular aspects that God wants us to pay attention to and deal with them seriously. And so Isaiah begins his pronouncement with what we read in verse 2. God calling all heaven and earth to witness what has just happened. What is going on? God called Israel out of Egypt and they are his own children like their parents. He's, you know, he wants them to be nurtured well, protected, disciplined. You know, he poured himself out to them. Israel, he did things that they didn't deserve, but because they were his children, his special possession, he decided to do the things that he did anyway. But in response, Israel does not turn out the kind of nation that God wanted them to be. What they turn out to do is to abandon their God. They didn't want God at all. They wanted his blessings. However, they didn't want him. And this is not just a foolish choice. It is rebellion. It is defiance. It is sin. Turning away from God's will for your life is sin. It is wickedness. In verse 3, we read these words. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know my people do not understand. In other words, that even animals are more appreciative of their owners than humans are of their creator. Can you imagine that? that compared to animals, the animals are better because they appreciate their owners. The ox are able to give respect to their owners. But Israel, my people, people created in my own image, have no regard for me. It's darkness. It's not funny. Isaiah isn't just, you know, judging, and we must not mistake Isaiah for judging Israel. When he says these words, <coughs> he is grieving. <coughs> Isaiah is grieving, he's not happy with what is happening, and the words he's using are intense, sinful, iniquity, evildoers, corrupt. Isaiah puts it even more strongly when he says, they have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have despised means they have provoked God into anger. Because God did not desire this for Israel. But they have done a lot of wickedness. They had the privilege to be called the children of the Most High God. They have misused that privilege, that privilege. And so they are outside God's will. Israel is not where it should be. Probably they didn't think so. But their behavior... Simply described that. And it's darkness. There is further grief. Look at verse 5 and 6. I want to read verse 5 and 6. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds and bruises and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. It is terrible. It is not looking nice. It is ugly. It is darkness. Beaten up so badly, so diseased. There is no health left for Israel. The spiritual condition of the nation of Israel is appalling. Outwardly, they looked fine. On the outside, Israel looked okay. Because they continued doing their festivals, they continued offering sacrifices, they continued doing the things they were doing. And on the outside, they are looking just okay. But inwardly, they are devastated. They are so sick, they are so damaged, frankly, because of their own rebellion against God. Listen, friends. 
Sometimes we can appear perfect on the outside. It's possible for you to attend all the Sunday services in the whole year. It can be your New Year's resolution. And on the outside, we look at you as doing fine. You sing nice, you dress nice, you speak nice. But on the inside, you are devastated. That is the condition of Israel. And I am sorry to say, but that is the condition of many of us, even those that claim to be children of God. <clears throat> so what is God telling us? What is the point of pointing out all this darkness? God is longing to provide some relief and some comfort. God does not just want Israel to feel bad. God's agenda is not that Israel would get in a corner and say, oh, we are the worst people, we don't even deserve any good. That's not the point of God. God wants Israel to pay attention to their condition and do something about their condition. Because it's possible that Israel is totally unaware of what is going on, but God is aware, and that is why God points out these things through his word. This is not just Isaiah talking. This is God himself speaking through Isaiah. And it is the word of God. That is the role of the word of God. The word of God is meant to edify us, to make us better. And through Isaiah, the word of God is meant to challenge Israel to get to their place. Haven't you read in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12? For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word helps us look deep into the inside of us. So God's word through Isaiah helps Israel to look on the inside. God does not want Israel to just feel bad about their situation. But God knows that this word, in as much as it is hard, it is necessary for healing. Hallelujah. And so sometimes the sermon will be difficult. Sometimes the sermon will be tough on you. It is not meant for you to feel bad. It is necessary for your healing to get to the place where God wants you to be. Praise the name of the Lord. And I do appreciate, including myself, we want many things. We want to be happy. Oh yeah, praise the Lord. We want a good family. We want to be comfortable living in a nice home, drive a nice car, a cool ride, you call it. We want our church to be revived. But sometimes that is not what God wants for us. God wants us to see ourselves for who we exactly are. God is more interested in you seeing your true self than just driving a good car. So God wants Israel to see itself, Israel to see themselves and the need for a savior, the need for a savior. It is part of God's love for us that would see ourselves for who we exactly are and therefore appreciate that we need Jesus, we need a savior. Isaiah describes what had happened to the nation of Israel when they abandoned God, and it is not funny. Verse 7 and verse 9, he uses words like desolate, devoured by foreigners. Compared to Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah is better. That is the situation of Israel. It is terrible. It is bad. In verses 11 to 15, he even rebukes their religious activities. Listen to verse 11 to 15. It is not looking nice. The multitudes of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fats of Fattened animals, I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? This trampling of my coats, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. 
They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Have you ever imagined that you can come to sing a song of worship and God says, don't make noise for me? That you get your whole, your salary, the whole of it, without remove even, removing rent or any. You would take your entire salary and bring it to the offertory basket. And God says, stop. I hate it. And you come, you close your eyes and lift up your hands. And you cry tears and you are praying. And God says, I don't want Israel did a lot of that, a lot of it. If there is anything Israel was good at, if you want, you can say Jews, it was religion. Oh, they were excellent at religion. And God says, you can do all you want to do, but I don't like it anymore. I hate it. Do you know why? Because religion can so easily mask what is going on on the inside. Religion can cover up. Religion can, can manipulate. And so Israel thinks they will manipulate God by religion. So he, he blesses them with health. He gives them prosperity. And he protects them from their enemies. And you know, and God is aware that religiosity can be deception. And he says, stop all that nonsense. I hate it. They are an abomination. He hates them and cannot bear them. So I hope you're asking, what does God really want? In this text, what we see is nothing but repentance. We've got to take action. We cannot accept darkness for what it is. We cannot be comfortable when things are not going the right way. We've got to take action actions. We've got to take our sins seriously. We've got to see our sin, ourselves, the same way God sees us. Not how our friends see us. Not how our pastors see us. Not how the fellowship leaders see us. We've got to see ourselves the way God see us, sees us. And so, if we have sinned, we should acknowledge that we have sinned and turn away from sin. And listen, there is good news, dear friends. There is hope that outshines all the darkness that Isaiah lists down in this text. After so much relentless rebuking, suddenly we see a change. In verse 18, we see a change. Let me read verse 18 for us. Come now. Let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Praise the name of the Lord. There is so much darkness, but there is something God is working out that is going to outshine all the darkness that has come down to Israel. So this old rebuke, this old relentless, you know, correction is a longing for God to restore a relationship with his people. All God wants is a relationship with Israel. And so he doesn't want to exercise his authority and he uses the words, Let's reason together. Let's talk this out. Let's talk to each other. This sounds gracious. The people God has described through Isaiah in the previous verses do not deserve to sit in the same place with God. But out of his amazing grace, he says, come, let's reason together. Let's talk this out. Let's talk to each other. Though we are sinful, dear friends, brothers and sisters, God is still willing, God is willing to talk with us. Praise the Lord. And so you might be here 
And on the outside, it looks beautiful. But you know that on the inside, you are devastated. On the inside, it is not okay. Do not sit here and think you are unworthy of God's presence. God actually wants you, right in that context, in that situation, to come to him and reason with him. You might have so many questions about why you're going through what you're going through, about why you have ended up the way you have ended up. But even then, it might even be because of your mistakes, because of, you know, things you were warned, you were corrected, but you adamantly, you decided to harden yourself and now things are burning you and you think, I am not worthy. Even then, the finished work of Jesus on the cross gives you the privilege to come in the presence of God and even gives you a right to come to God and put things right. Hallelujah. And so though we are sinful, he promises, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Scarlet or crimson was uh, a kind of dye in the Bible times that was impossible to wash out of clothes. So, Isaiah uses this word to describe the nature of our sin, that it is impossible to come out by our own efforts. It does not matter how many times you try to wash and make yourself like look nice. This dye called crimson, this crimson, this sin on the inside of you cannot be washed out by your efforts. There is no amount of Calvin Klein perfumes that you'll wear, no amount of detergent you'll use for you to be clean enough. It only takes the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the blood of Christ that cleanses us and washes us. Praise the name of the Lord. So forget your efforts, forget your religion, forget your doing, and think about what God has already done in giving us his son, Jesus Christ, only that is deep enough to wash our deep sins that we are stuck with. The grace of God can wash it all out completely. Snow white. It does not only remove our guilt, it totally purifies us. Praise the Lord. Jesus is shed blood. It totally cleanses us and purifies us. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Praise the name of the Lord. The wounds of Jesus are able to deal with the deepest level of sin. And this is how much God loves us. Our sins make us utterly hopeless. God's finished work on the cross gives us all the hope. It is that hope that outweighs all other hopes. And there is good news this afternoon that if we would just turn to Jesus Christ, he is willing to forgive us and heal us completely and totally. So be willing and obedient and test God's goodness. I like it in verse 19 and verse 20. If I may read those verses as I close. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now for Israel, to eat Eat, to eat of the good of the land was to do with the promised land. But for us, it is even better than just the promised land in Canaan. The good of the land is eternity. Through the work of Jesus Christ, we have the privilege to share eternity with our Heavenly Father. There is no middle ground. Please, please take note. Willing and obedient. And you can only do that or be unwilling and therefore disobedient. 
those that are willing and obedient will inherit, will be co-heirs with Christ of the kingdom of God. And those that are unwilling, they have chosen for themselves God's enemy, the devil. So though we are sinful, God wants to make us holy. God wants us to have a relationship with him. And this afternoon we can be restored to that relationship. Jesus is our only hope. There is nothing else. There is no amount of wealth that can take you out of hopelessness. It is only Jesus Christ that is our hope. And so God has determined to accomplish his salvation for you through your surrender to Jesus Christ. And this afternoon, I want to say to us, it's possible that we have been hit with a lot of darkness. I'm not talking about anything outside, but deep within. And God knows what is happening on the inside. He's not here to just make you feel bad. He is longing for a restored relationship with him. And so if you are in position, willing to offer your heart to him, he is more than willing to receive you this afternoon. Let's bow in prayer. And before I pray, I just want to offer an opportunity to that one person who says, I am willing to surrender my life to Jesus, have lived in darkness. It's not just Israel, but it's you. You know the Spirit of God is witnessing to you that you need a Savior. And this afternoon, you'd want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And you want to make that public. I want to give you an opportunity to just come to the front and I would want to pray with you. You'd want to give your life to Jesus. And you want to make that public, would you come to the front? I would want us to pray together. The voice of God is calling out to you. It doesn't matter how far low you have fallen. His grace is sufficient for you to be restored. No matter the darkness, his grace outshines that darkness. The grace of God outweighs your sin. Father, we thank you. We are sorry for the times we've thought about doing things as a source of our acceptance. Thank you for reminding us this afternoon that you're more interested in our hearts than just what we do. Yes, we know, Lord, that we live in this world and there are so many things that would make life easy and comfortable. But that does not take away the need for us to give you our hearts. And I pray for these, my brothers and sisters, this afternoon. Maybe there is a sense of lostness. There is a sense of turning away from you. Will you restore us to that place of trusting and surrendering to you, Lord? Thank you for loving us so much so that you have not given up on us. How we honor you and love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.